morning. Welcome to Holy Trinity Church, West Bromwich. Um, welcome to anyone watching online on YouTube. Uh, we pray this service is a blessing to us all. We're going to prepare our hearts to worship God in the opening words of our service. What I'm going to suggest we do is stay seated for the first two sections and then it says we stand up. At that point, let's all stand up. So, have you got the order of service in front of you? I'll say the words in light print and we all say the words together in the bold print. We prepare our hearts for worship. Rejoice in the Lord, all the earth. Remember the Lord is our God. We are his God and he us. Come into his temple with praise. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. The love of the Lord never fails. God will be faithful forever. Amen. Amen. Since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us turn firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. And find grace to help us in our time of need. Amen. We stand up and praise you. Lord our God, for you are eternal. Blessed be your glorious name, exalted above all honor and praise. Are you ready to sing praises to God? Yes, yes I hope so. Uh, our first song is called, All Creatures of Our God and King. Lift up your voice and with us sing. And in one of the verses, we, the last verse, let all things their creator Bless and worship him in humbleness. Let's sing.
praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, whether we are in the mood to praise you because life is good, or whether we are struggling to praise you because life is hard, we pray that you would give us hearts full of wonder and awe for you. Amen. Amen. Do take a seat. We're going to pray the collect. This is the third Sunday after Easter. And so we pray together. Almighty God, you show the light of your truth to those who are in error, so that they may return to the way of righteousness. Grant to all who are admitted into the fellowship of Christ's religion that they may reject everything that is contrary to their profession and follow whatever is in agreement with it. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. On today's Bible reading from Hebrews 13, we will be um, challenged to uh, reject those ways that we are in error and to return to ways of righteousness, but we'll be challenged within the confidence we have as we trust in Jesus, our great high priest. And we do that now as we turn to God to, to confess our sins, we can turn to him in 100% confidence that Jesus died for our sins and loves us, and God loves us because of that if we trust in him. But we only hear what God hates so we don't live in ways that anger him. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Lord, help us not to do the things you hate. Call to confession. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked abandon their ways. And our righteous their thoughts. Turn back to the Lord who will have mercy. To our God who will richly pardon. Jesus said, before you offer your gift, go and be reconciled. As sisters and brothers in God's family, we come together to ask our Father for forgiveness. Let's take a moment to reflect. Ask God by his Spirit to highlight any area of life that you should confess to him and uh, any reconciliation that needs to happen between you and someone else. And we pray, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. We ask for God's help, but also are assured of his absolution, which is his dealing with our sins on the cross. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, Heal and strengthen us by his Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm going to send our young people out with Jackie and Lydia, I think. Um, so if you're primary school age, it is Sunday Club Junior time. We're going to pray for you as you go. And as the church kind of empties, <laughs> it's lovely to see so many young people, isn't it? Really lovely. Let's pray for us all. Lord, we pray for our young people. We pray for Jackie and Vidya 
and we pray for ourselves here, Lord, you would speak to us. We'd hear your voice, know your love for us in Jesus, and respond in faith and obedience. Amen. All right, well, we're going to break the service at this point just to do notices, um, important notices. We turn to the back of your order of service. I do apologise, but I've been quite unclear, I think, about what we're planning to do next Sunday. There is a, a form for people to fill in, which will allow us, in place of a sermon, to share what God has been teaching us as individuals through the letter to the Hebrews. So, my hope is that next week there'll be three, four, five people who will be able to stand here, share a testimony of what you yourself have learned what God's been revealing to you about himself, about Jesus, about confidence, about um, whatever it might be, how it's, why it's been important to you, and how it's helped you. So, um, the form I gave out at the beginning said I wanted responses by today. Um, I have a few responses, but I'm willing to wait till tomorrow if you want to to fill us in, or maybe even by Wednesday, to be honest. We can, we can still plan the service by Wednesday. But if you want to fill that in today, there are forms at the back of the table, and you can hand it to me, and we'll, we'll invite people to come and share what they've been learning. That's next Sunday, and if there's more than, if there's more than five, brilliant, we'll do two weeks of that, because I think it's really important and encouraging to hear how God is speaking to each of us individually. Um, down the, underneath the annual parochial church meeting, the notice for care groups, which start this Wednesday. We had a prayer meeting last Wednesday, and um, so do take a program. They're also on the back desk, behind the, just behind the sound desk, side refreshments. Uh, the building will be open at 7.15 for 7.30 start, and they'll also be on Zoom. There's the meeting ID for Zoom, and that's valid for the next 19 weeks. Uh, and invite a friend. Come along with a friend. That's Care groups, um, this is not on the sheet, but there's a flyer available. If you're in, if you're 11 to 14 in secondary school, it's like year one to nine, year one to 10, uh, sorry, year seven to 10, um, we're gonna start Sunday Club Youth. So we've got Sunday Club Juniors, Sunday Club Minis is kind of getting started, and we're gonna have Sunday Club Youth. So, um, there's three dates before the summer holidays for that on a Sunday. The idea is to have it every second week if we can. Please be praying for Helen and Amanda who lead that, but also pray that we'll get more leaders and helpers to enable that to happen. That we can teach the next generation the great things of the Lord. Um, for tomorrow, bottom of the notices, there's a building upgrade. The archdeacon and architects are coming tomorrow at two o'clock. If you have relevant experience in building projects or in finance and can help with the project, please see me or Jack or Sonia before the meeting. That's tomorrow at two o'clock. Please be praying for us as a church. The, the buildings are needing to be updated, upgraded, um, to make them more um, accessible for people who are disabled, more um, visible because if you really look at this place walking past you think it's closed even when it's open. Um, more um, flexible, it's quite a big space and we sometimes use it for smaller meetings, it's big, it's hard to heat. Um, so it's all that sort of stuff. We want to make our heating um, less expensive to the planet and to our pocket. So all that's being planned and so be praying for the, please be praying for the buildings that they might serve us as a church and serve the gospel in our community. Good. Thank you for listening to those. We are going to turn to God's word in a moment, but before we do that, there's a discussion question on the notice sheet to help us prepare for God's word. So if you want to talk to people next to you, you can. If you want to think about it on your own, you can. What is needed for a local church to be a true church? What is needed for a local church to be a true church? Have a little chat. Think about those things. Okay, let's have the Bible. Yvonne's going to read the Bible. They, the reading 
if one has slightly changed the whole chapter. I didn't tell you, I'm sorry. Spring up on you. Sorry? Just extra. Good morning, church. Today, our Bible reading will be taken from the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, from verse 1. Thanks to Neil, he changed it. Yes, sir. <laughs> Last reading. Oh, so bad. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 13, from verse 1 to 25. Are we there? Yep. Okay, let's go. Concluding exhortations. Keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers. For by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners, and those who were ill-treated as if you yourselves, you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say be confident, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders who speak the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of, your, of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by ceremonial foods, which are of no value to those who eat them. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most high place, holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go outside, go to him outside the camp, bury the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for that city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of leaves that confess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good, everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written you only a short letter. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Greet all your leaders and all God's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. Grace be with you all. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Thank you, Vaughan. Well read. And uh, it's really clear. We're going we're gonna to do a bit of work together on this this morning. Um, what does a church need to be a true church? 
and the sermon's going to come in two parts. The first part, we'll, we will examine ourselves, do some self-reflection, put um, the spotlight of God's Word on our own lives. And the second part, we're going to turn the spotlight around and focus it on Jesus again, on God the Father and the Holy Spirit, that we might have complete confidence to enter His presence. I suspect the result of doing the first half will be a lack of confidence, a questioning of ourselves, but by the second half, confidence in Jesus. Now remember that this letter has been written to a church which is suffering persecution, and so it applies to all people at all times, but particularly when the church is under pressure. So if there are abusive rulers or cruel governments or powerful systems that are against the church and the mission of the church, then um, the conduct, the nine ways in which church members to behave really applies, but it applies at all times. So followers of Jesus are to be confident people, just remembering what we've been learning through this letter. We are to be confident to enter the presence of the Holy God by the blood of Jesus. Confident because he's better than angels. Confident because he's better than Moses. Confident because he's better than the sacrifice of bulls and goats. Confident because he's better than the Old Testament priesthood. Confident because Jesus has guaranteed a place for his people in God's eternal tabernacle, the holy place of holies eternally there with him. For everyone who's got faith in Jesus, chapter 11, that is our sure hope. So with that confidence, we're going to see that it would be wrong when the world is pressurizing the church, or people are pressurizing the church, it be wrong to retaliate against that evil, but we are not to shrink back, we are not to turn away from each other, not to turn away from God, and we're not to blend back into the world, but fix our eyes on Jesus. That's as, that's as far as we got up to chapter 10. The first 10 chapters were all about fixing eyes on Jesus, not turning away. Chapter 11, keep the faith. Chapter 12, endure hardship as loving discipline from a loving Father. And then chapter 13, final exhortations. So, where can we be doing better? The nine areas listed in the order of service, we go through each one, one minute on each one. So, fill the blanks in the left-hand side from the passage as we read them, and then score yourself from one to ten, one being a low score, I'm not doing well in this area, ten being a high score, and um, I'll give you a little bit of silence, maybe 10, 15 seconds to reflect between each point to put your score in. So let's just make a start on the passage. Um, the first point being, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. The missing word, or, the missing word there is loving relationships with all my church family members, loving relationships with one another. That is a keep on loving one another a constant love, a consistent love? Do you see other church members as family and love them like family? I'll give you a few seconds to score yourself on your love for other members of Holy Trinity. Next one, verse 2. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so some have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. So the next blank on the left is love and um, hospitable, hospitable relationships with strangers. When someone new arrives at Holy Trinity Church, it is everybody's responsibility to be hospitable. So do you offer a warm welcome? Is your first reaction to seeing someone new, I want to offer that person hospitality? 
Do you offer a tea or a coffee, either at your home or in a cafe, or offer a lunch? Do you aim to care for and get to know the newcomer so that the stranger is no longer a stranger? Two more questions. What if the stranger has a different colour of skin to you? Or what if they speak a different language to you? Does your hospitality change in those cases? Score yourself from one to ten. Verse 3, continue to remember those in prison, remember those are imprisoned for being followers of Jesus, as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are ill-treated as if you yourselves were suffering. I think the words, maybe two words there, caring and sharing, having caring, sharing relationships with those in prison for following Jesus. Now we don't live in a Muslim country, or an atheist communist country, or a Hindu nation, all of which are places where Christians are routinely harassed for being Christians, imprisoned, sometimes killed, church buildings demolished. So we should be very thankful that this nation has been under the influence of the teachings of Jesus Christ for over a thousand years, although it hasn't been for the last generation. But even then, maybe you know someone who's been given a hard time for following Jesus. Maybe their workplace is actually discriminating against them because it seems to be okay to discriminate against Christians in the workplace. Or maybe in the community or school. Or if there's a difference between family faith and the individual, maybe the family is persecuting. What kind of care and support are you offering your brothers and sisters who are being ill-treated? Number four, um, verse four, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. I wonder if the missing word here should be pure sexual relationships. Pure sexual relationships. Last week in chapter 12, we saw how God's goal for us is not our happiness or our um, comfort or our prosperity, that's not God's goal for us. Our God's goal is that we share in His holiness. His holiness is His character, of, which is different to us, and that we share in His purity, His faithfulness, His honesty, and so forth. So, Christians are to have a really high view of marriage. It's to be honoured by all. It's the goal of our relationships. Marriage is a unique relationship of faithfulness, honesty, and purity between one man and one woman that reflects the relationship of Jesus and his church, the bride. So everyone is to have the goal of sexual holiness and purity. There should be no sexual immorality that will be judged by God. No sexual activity outside marriage of a man and a woman. Um, especially between church members, but also between church members and those outside the church. So marriage and sexual purity are God's design for his church, and they are really difficult to achieve. It's probably the hardest area, especially in our current generation, where sexual purity is under, is, has, there's no value in it in our culture. So every, every human being 
has strong sexual desires, and everyone married or single has struggles and battles in, in this area of sexuality. So sometimes we know we lose those battles, and sometimes we're the victims of those who've lost the battles themselves. It works out in all kinds of painful ways where people are victims of other people's sexual um, sin and failing. So for us, I think, as, mar- as a church, to score ourselves, we have to ask, brothers and sisters, do you value and honor marriage as, as God's goal for his people? And then, brothers, how open and honest are you with your closest brothers about your own struggles and areas of sexual desire and temptation? I think for, for men, particularly in areas of pornography, but it could be other things, um, temptations. And sisters, how do, honest and open are you with your closest sisters about your struggles in areas of sexual desire and temptation? Um, let's score ourselves one to ten on honouring marriage and being open with the struggles to have pure sexual relationships. Verse five, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. I think the missing word here in the order of service is healthy relationships with money. So not being greedy, obviously, not loving money, but I think for those who have money, which is more than we need to live on, then are you generous with that money? That's the best way to test how um, much you love money. Are you generous? Do you give it away? And if you struggle financially to get by, um, are you content with what you have? If you are truly kind of destitute, hungry, cold, struggling, you can't make ends meet, then what are you doing to find help and particularly help from your church family. Invite, invite people to ask for help as a church family. So score yourselves from one to 10 on your relationship with money. Right, we're over halfway. So let's go on to the breathing point halfway through verse six. So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? What a great thing to say in the face of persecution. What can mere mortals do to me? Can't take away my faith in Jesus. Can't take away my eternal life. What's the worst we can do? Then verse 7. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. I think the leaders here we're talking about are the apostles, um, who are the ones who received the teaching from Jesus directly, who witnessed his resurrection, and who started the movement against all the powers and authorities in this wicked age. And, the, and we're to consider what they spoke. So I think in this one, the missing word, or, word is respectful relationships with the apostles, or for the apostles, for the apostles. So, how much do you respect the teaching of the apostles in the Bible, the teachers about Jesus? Do you find yourself wrestling with the Bible, trying to get to grips with it, trying to dig down into the truth? Well, if that's you, then score yourself high. If you find yourself picking and choosing between different verses, like you pick and choose from a chocolate box. I call that chocolate box reading the Bible. I like the strawberry creams, don't like the toffees. Do you do that with the Bible? Well, if you do that, then score yourself low. If you disregard the Bible altogether, give yourself zero. Jesus is unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, so we can get to know him truly through the teaching of the apostles. So give yourself a second to, to say, do you wrestle with scripture? Do you have a 
respect for the teachings of the apostles. And going to zero for disregarding the Bible. Next. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. This is the this is the other side of the same coin. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods. There's the contrast between the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and trying to earn favor by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit to those who do so. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. So are you carried away by all kinds of strange or false teachings contrary to the teaching of the apostles? So it's a kind of, it's a kind of the same question, really. Um, yeah, sorry, it's the same question. I'm in the same question. Sorry, we're still on, we're still on the list of the apostles. The high priest carries the blood of animals. That's the next, this is the next point. Right, so fit, score yourself on the relationship of the apostles. The next one is going to be arm's length relationship to culture. So the arm's length relationship to culture is like this. The high priest carries the blood of animals, verse 12, into the most, sorry, verse 11, into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him as of the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore, for we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for a city that is to come. So arm's length, relationship with culture, that the Hebrew followers of Jesus had gone outside their culture, were following Jesus, they were getting persecuted by the Romans and rejected by their own people. So they were drifting back to the temple, back to their culture, back to that empty way of life, empty ceremony, back to meaninglessness, and they were finding it too hard to be different, hard to stand with Jesus against evil and corruption. So we are, as followers of Jesus, to stand outside the city, outside the culture at arm's length, to follow him, bearing the disgrace that he bore, taking the mockery, taking the, why don't you join in the life that we join in? Why don't you just give up on sexual purity? Why don't you give up on marriage? Why don't you just join in? So, do you like to be in with the in crowd, in with the culture? Do you like to blend in with the world? Then score yourself low. But if you like to bear the disgrace that Jesus bore by standing apart from the culture, not, not, to, not to stand back with finger judging, but to stand back different and holy, then score yourself high. Relationships with local church leaders. What's the blank there? Verse 17. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. I find that slightly frightening that as a church leader I will give account to God for the way I lead. Do this so that, you, so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, but that there would be a bit, for that would be of no benefit to you. I think the missing word here is submissive. Submit to their authority. Let me explain that. So local church leaders are to exercise authority. The authority is limited to moral authority. The commandments of God. And so leaders have no authority to tell people who to marry, where to live, what jobs to get. Followers of Jesus have freedom to choose those things within the moral boundaries of God's commandments. So you, as church members, can make my life and the other church leaders, Helen and the church wardens, you can make our life a joy, which will be a benefit to you by not fighting, disagreeing, arguing um, with leaders about moral behavior that's out of line. So if, if, if one of the church leaders says, can we have a chat about your behavior? It's, not what God wants for you. 
Um, it's a joy if you go, yes, of course, I'm sorry, I see that now, I want to confess my sins, return to the Lord, walk in his ways, um, under his grace. But if you put up a fight and argue and disobey, in any way, the commandments of God, you just make yourself a burden to me or Helen or the wardens. And it's no benefit to you or anybody else. So score yourself on submissive relationships to church leaders. And the last one is prayer for others. Pray for us. We are sure we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. Do you pray for others? Pray for the writer of the letter. Not that he, you can't pray for him now, he's dead. But pray for those around us have a clear conscience to live an honorable way of life, to pray for restored relationships. If you do pray that way, then score yourself high. If you don't pray, for clear consciences or honourable ways of life or be to restore and square yourself below. Right. So, what does a church need to be a true church? Well, in one way we answer that at a horizontal level between people. We need us to behave the way that God wants us to behave as a a church, a holy church, separated from the ways of the world. Um, so the exercise now for us to do is, um, will you circle your two highest scores and just give thanks to God that that's evidence of the work he's done in your life so far. Circle your two highest scores and give thanks to God for them. And then circle your two lowest scores and ask God for help in those areas of your life. Ask God to help you make them a focus for the next few weeks or months. Say, God, I need your help in these areas that I might play my part in a true church fellowship. Now, um, If you didn't score 10 out of 10 on all of them, I don't think anyone, I, I didn't score 10 on any of them, then you might be wondering if you're good enough for God. Am I really, I don't know, am I just a rubbish church member? Am I gonna be good enough for God? If you scored ones and twos for all nine areas, you might be wondering if you're a Christian at all. You might just go, I'm, I'm just so rubbish. I'm not doing anything right. So the second half of this message is so important because we, God does not want us to be left lacking confidence in his presence. Jesus, we've seen through the letter, we're going back to where we started, gives us 100% confidence to enter God's holy place. And it's not based on the scores that we've just done. Let's look at verses 20 and 21 and the bottom of the sheet to fill it in. We're going to do this much quicker. 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what's pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's fill in the blanks. The God of? Peace. The God of peace, not the God of war. The God of peace, not of fighting. The God of peace, not of conflict. We can have confidence because no matter how low we've scored, God has come to make peace. Blood of? Eternal covenant. Eternal. How long is eternal? Forever. From everlasting to everlasting. A covenant is an agreement or a contract or a promise. It kind of has all those ideas in it. So God made a promise or an agreement or a contract before he created time, that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit swore together that the blood of Jesus would be shed before the creation of time. 
And so we can have confidence because God planned all this before the creation of the universe, eternally covenanted to save his people by his blood. Who brought back from the dead. dead. Where's our confidence? That Jesus rose again. We can have confidence because Jesus conquered the grave. Jesus the great shepherd of the sheep. Who are the sheep? We are. What are we like? We get lost. We get attacked by wolves. We get injured. We get hungry. But we can have confidence because Jesus is our great shepherd. He He finds the lost. He protects the vulnerable. He protects our faith in him. He heals our wounds and feeds us. He will equip you with everything good for doing his will. So we can have confidence because ultimately any good we do is because he equipped us to do it. May he work in us what is pleasing to him. Uh, We can have confidence because when the Holy Spirit's at work in us, God smiles. He smiles. It is pleasing to him. If he takes me and my lowest score, I've got three equal lowest scores. Let's just say arm's length relationship to culture. I find that really difficult. I want to be able to reach out to people with the good news of Jesus, but then do I get too soaked up in the culture? Or am I fully enough? It's really difficult. So as he works in us by his spirit, he equips us and then he's pleased with whenever we've gone from a four to a five, for example. So through, next one, Jesus Christ. We can have confidence because the Holy Spirit works in us through Jesus Christ by his words and example to make the Father pleased. To whom be? So if he equips us, or he, let's let's go back to the beginning. If he began before the creation of the world, a covenant in his blood, he shed his blood, he rose from the, the grave, he is the one who equips us. I've lost my page. He he, He shepherds us, equips us, he works in us through Jesus. Who gets the glory? He gets the glory. <laughs> it's never me. It's never about Neil Robbie or anybody else. It's all about Jesus getting the glory forever and ever and ever. So now look at your top scores, the top section. You cannot be confident in those. You can have no confidence in those top scores. Even if you've got nines and tens, you cannot be confident. But look at the God of peace. Look at Jesus. Look at the great shepherd of the sheep. Know the Holy Spirit's equipping you to do good through Jesus. And then your confidence is complete, 100%. He is at work. We are his followers. What does a church need to be a true church? Brothers and sisters, we need Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the teachings of the apostles to be a true church. Jesus gave us the apostles, he taught them how to teach us, the Holy Spirit guided them and that Holy Spirit guides us. All we need are the teachings of the apostles to have confidence in them, to trust in Jesus, that he'll do his work and the Holy Spirit will be doing his work and then brothers and sisters will be a true church as we live for him, equipped by him, and ready to live and die for him. Shall we pray? Father God, I pray for each one of us here, Lord, whether we've marked ourselves high or low, pray against any pride, pray against any despair. I pray, Lord, that we just be joyful because you are the one who is the God of peace. You are the one 
who by the blood of the eternal covenant has brought back from the dead the Lord Jesus Christ, our great shepherd of the sheep. Jesus, thank you that you're our shepherd. Thank you that you seek the lost. Thank you that you protect us in our faith from the attacks of all sorts of evil. Thank you that you heal the injured. Thank you that you are the one, uh, Lord, who strengthens us by feeding us. Lord, I thank you that all things eventually turn back to your glory. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us in this generation to live as your followers, to take seriously all those things we've heard today. Lord, to put you first in our lives. Lord, I pray that we would be a light in the darkness. Lord, I pray that we would each help us to give thanks to you where our relationships have been loving, where our hospital, hospi hospitality for strangers is strong, where our care for those who are ill-treated has been obvious, Lord, for pure sexual relationships, for healthy relationship with money, Lord, for respectful relationship with the Apostles' teaching, the arm's length relationship with culture, for the submissive relationships of local church leaders and our prayer for one another. Lord, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe there's a song we need to sing which has in every verse that contrast between us called to that high living and the confidence we have in Jesus. Church of God, elect and glorious, be the people. <coughs> um, I can't remember the rest of that verse, but it's verse 2. God has called you out of darkness into his most marvelous light, brought his truth to life within you, turned your blindness into sight. Let your light shine out around, around you, that God's name is glorified, and all find fresh hope and purpose in Christ Jesus crucified. Shall we stand and sing?
took a seat and we'll turn to our time of intercessions. Didn't check the rota. Who's who's who drank for intercessions? Is it me? Stata? No? Yeah. Well they're not here. Okay, the person who said this meant to be praying is not here. I will pray and then We'll finish our service. Father, we pray that you would, in our generation, teach us where our lives need to be strengthened in your service. Lord, I pray that the church in this land would be so distinct and holy, loving, faithful, kind, compassionate, honest, pure. Lord, may our marriage relationships be a witness to a world where there's sexual chaos and pain and suffering. Lord, may that witness point to you, Jesus, as the perfect groom for your bride. We come to you, Jesus, with our debts and our misery and our shameful name, and we thank you that you give us your riches taking away our debts. You give us your name, call us holy, children of the most high God. We thank you, Jesus, for all you are doing. So we pray for the church in this land. Lord, at a time where we know we are compromised, we know we have drifted, we know we're not at arm's length from the culture, we know we're being consumed by all kinds of false teachings and strange doctrines. Lord, we pray that you would help us as a whole church to be really respectful of the apostles' teaching, to wrestle and wrestle and wrestle until we come to the truth. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to put, to put you first and not ourselves. Lord, we pray that we would not be swayed by uh, any gospel of, false gospel of comfort or false gospel of prosperity or false gospel of healing for our sicknesses, but Lord, we pray that the gospel of holiness would be the gospel that we all know and love, that we would endure hardship as your children loved by you, as you refine us through the fires. We pray, Jesus, that you'd help us keep our eyes fixed on you, the author and perfecter of our faith, Lord, who for the joy set before you endured the cross, scorned at shame, and have sat down at the right hand of the Father. Lord, that you will come again to judge the living and the dead. We pray we be ready for that day, fully confident in you and serving you to bring you glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Lord, we are called to share in the sufferings of those who are being persecuted. And so we pray for Christians in Afghanistan today, Lord. Oh, Lord, we cry to you for them. As they gather in fear and in secrecy, Lord, fearful of the Taliban's brutality, fearful of the, the Taliban's cruelty, Lord, the readiness to kill anyone, we pray you'd protect them. We pray too for those in North Korea where the atheist government, the cult of Kim Jong-il would be, would be um, the, the, all those there, Lord, who are again meeting in fear and secrecy. Lord, we pray you'd, you'd strengthen them in their faith. Help us to suffer as if we're suffering with them. Lord, to, to share their pain in our hearts. We pray too for those who are in Iran or, Lord, in Russia. Lord, where, again, a communist government and a Muslim government are, are persecuting Christians, closing colleges, putting people in jail. Oh, Lord, we cry to you that the church around the world would stand united. Lord, as, as we are one body with one saviour, one spirit, one baptism, one faith. Lord, help us to support and uphold each other, to care and to share. Lord, we pray for your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we pray, Lord, for those who are sick. We pray for those who are mourning. We pray for all who are wearied by the, the groans of this broken creation, Lord whether they're suffering through no fault of their own, the ills of a broken world, whether they're suffering from, from 
fallouts or disputes with friends, family, and neighbors, whether they're suffering, Lord, as Christians, we pray you would uphold the sick, heal them, Lord. Bring them wholeness and peace, O oh God of peace. We pray for all who are grieving, Lord, that the hope of the gospel will fill our hearts, that we might one day be reunited with you and with those who've gone before us by faith in the one who saves. In whose name we pray. Amen. And so we pray together the words that Jesus taught us, printed in the order of service. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Uh, we're going to do something different today. We're going to finish with two songs um, because these songs capture what we've been thinking about today. The first is the everlasting arms. When our life is weary and we're feeling weak, rest in the everlasting arms. And then finishing off with crowning Jesus with many crowns, the man upon the throne. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn songs.
we crown you, Jesus, with many crowns, for you are King of all. We pray that thrones in our generation would fall before you. Lord, we pray that the world would be united in you. And we pray that your church at this time around the world, hard pressed on every side, would stand firm, not shrink back, but keep fixing their eyes on you. In your name we pray. Amen. And so the blessing, may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And we say to each other, in darkness and in light, in trouble and in joy, Help us, Heavenly Father, to trust your love, serve your purpose, and to praise your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.